More and more people in the AI space are saying that we've sort of more or less achieved AGI, or at least we're kind of quickly will achieve it. And a lot of them are setting their sights on super intelligence. For example, here's a brief quote from Sam Altman's blog post titled Reflections. He's saying we are not confident we know how to build AGI as we have traditionally understood it. If you're wondering how Sam Altman defines AGI, here's the most recent interview where he's saying the very rough way he tries to think about is when an AI system can do what very skilled humans in important jobs can do. He'd call that AGI. AGI rolls around only once. Subscribe. What happens to humans when we have AGI? What happens to working people, people that rely on a salary, a wage to get food for the family? Well, that's still up for debate. I tried to present sort of a mix of perspectives, and we've seen some good ones, some fairly ambitious and positive ones. Recently, this post jumped out at me. It's by L. Rudolph L. on his substack, No Set Gauge. And it's called Capital, AGI, and Human Ambition. And I'm not going to bury the lead here. Here's the main takeaway of this post. Labor replacing AI, right? So what Sam Altman is defining as AGI, will shift the relative importance of human versus non-human factors of production, which reduces the incentives for society to care about humans while making existing powers more effective and entrenched. We've seen a lot of people say that money won't matter post-AGI. The author believes that this is likely completely incorrect. So first of all, labor is a human mental and physical effort that produces something of value. Things like Xboxes, bacon, and, you know, other stuff. Mainly Xboxes and bacon. But capital goods are things like factories, data centers, and software. Things that humans have built that are used in the production of goods and services. So it's stuff that builds other stuff. Stuff we like, stuff of value, e.g. Xbox and bacon. He's using capital here to refer to both stock of capital goods and the money you can pay to buy them. And he'll say money when he wants to include capital goods. So there's an important sentence here. He's saying the key economic effect of AI is that it makes capital a more and more general substitute for labor. Meaning you don't need to pay people for their work if you can get a robot or some sort of an AI software to do that work for you. If you have the money to do it, you don't need human labor. And here he's saying, I will walk through the consequences of this and end up concluding that labor replacing AI means, one, the ability to buy results in the real world will dramatically go up. Human ability to wield power in the real world will dramatically go down, at least without money. Because there will be no more incentives for states, companies, or other institutions to care about humans. And it will be harder for humans to achieve outlier outcomes relative to their starting resources. Radical equalizing measures are unlikely. He concludes overall this points to a neglected downside of transformative AI that society might become permanently static and the current power imbalances might be amplified and turned immutable. By the way, Sam Altman posted a similar kind of like a breakdown uh, back in March 16, 2021, talking about something called Moore's Law for Everything. It starts out very similar to the other posts that we're reading. Sam Altman says a software that can think and learn will do more and more of the work that people do now. Even more power will shift from labor to capital. If public policy doesn't adapt accordingly, most people will end up worse than they are today. So kind of keep this in mind. So they start out with kind of the same premises, right? So and kind of like the beginning argument is identical. AI and robotics will reduce the cost of human labor. By default, you know, if it just kind of runs wild, then the more power will shift from labor to capital. So next he walks through a few scenarios that could potentially happen. One where we may see a worldwide end to material poverty with some small percentage of wealthy Americans kind of building up extreme wealth from AI, but also some dynamics that could effectively disempower much of the world's population, where even material comfort could be an issue. He's saying, what most emotionally moves me about these scenarios is that a static society with a locked-in ruling caste does not seem dynamic or alive to me. We should not kill human ambition if we can help it. All right, so what is sort of the default solution? Well, so first of all, assume that human labor, the cost of human labor drops because of AI. We'll call this a labor replacing AI. There are two levels of the standard solution to the resulting unemployment problem. Governments will adopt something like a uh, universal basic income, UBI. Two, we will quickly hit superintelligence and assuming the superintelligence is aligned, live in a post-scarcity technological wonderland where everything is possible. Now, of course, prices will still be a thing because it's largely about communicating information. So even if everything's uh, managed by the AI, there's still gonna be some sort of pricing signals, even if, you know, humans aren't even aware of it. 
And also remember that, of course, abundance will still be finite and therefore must be allocated. So for example, land. People like living near the beach. There's only so much coastal property available. So we do still need some sort of a pricing or some other solution for scarcity. Next, he talks about the fact that money currently struggles to buy talent. So especially in kind of the tech industry where you have very large contracts, very large salaries, it's difficult to acquire the top talent, the top labor. It's hard to judge talent. Talent is rare. Even if you can locate it, the top talent tends to be less amenable to being bought out by money than others. With labor replacing AI, these problems go away. The price of talent will go down massively. AIs will be cheaper than the equal with human labor, and the competition will be fierce to create copies that are as good or better. The final big bottleneck for converting money to talent is that the top talent, they have complicated human preferences. They have choices. In contrast, AIs exist specifically so they can be trivially bought out. Most people's power and leverage derives from labor, from getting paid, from having money. Next, he talks about why are states nice? You guys granted by states that care about human welfare. Over the past few centuries, there's a big shift towards states caring about humans. Why? Well, there are moral changes. Affluence and technology means we can produce more stuff, more goods, more basic goods. And incentives for states to care about freedom, prosperity, and education. Of course, this was driven uh, by the state to be economically competitive. They needed efficient markets, a good education system, skilled workers, etc. And contrast this to the feudal system where the winning strategy was building an extractive upper class to rule over a population of illiterate peasants and spend a big share of extracted rents on winning wars against nearby states. I mean, yeah. And the main point here is after labor replacing AI, the state will no longer need to spend the resources on humans to have that competitive advantage. And humans will also have less leverage over states. They can go on strike and they can demand that the government invest in them in return for being stronger in a decade or a few decades. And the point here is we better lock in the benevolence that the states have towards us, the power that we currently yield, to make sure it doesn't go away in the future and kick us back to kind of the feudal ages. And of course, labor replacing AI will sort of kill these outlier success of various talented and interesting people. AI will, by default, obsolete human entrepreneurship, the hard sciences as AI becomes the innovator and even potentially eliminating intellectuals. As he says here, probably it doesn't look good for the human intellectuals. I suspect that a lot of why intellectuals' ideologies can have so much power is that they're products of a genius in a world where genius is rare. Politics might be the least affected since he's guessing that most humans specifically want a human to do that job. Is that true, I wonder? I mean, a lot of people would, I think, prefer at least certain decisions to be made by an impartial AGI. This would eliminate corruption, bias, a lot of things. I mean, there's there's certainly some positives. I'm not saying there's no negatives, but certainly you can see how it might work better under certain scenarios. Of course, military will be a lot more centralized. There's going to be less people that are needed to take action and chances for a Napoleon of the drones to win against existing armies and religions where perhaps when it comes to starting a new religions, AI might be extremely, extremely good at. We've seen already certain Twitter profiles of spitting up certain quasi-religious themes to make money, start their own crypto coins, and just in general kind of go a little bit more viral than you'd expect. Once the labor replacing AI is here, UBI is passed, no one's starving, companies and countries are scrambled to make the best use of AI, so that sort of redistribution of wealth is unlikely to be at the top of the political agenda. So what is the default outcome? Money will be able to buy results in the real world better than ever. People's labor gives them less leverage than ever before. Achieving outlier success through your labor in most or all areas is now impossible. There was no transformative level of capital either within or between countries. So in conclusion, there is a sort of unequal, unprecedentedly static, and AI has benefits that flow to everyone. And yes, some are richer than others, but everyone has a great standard of living. The only realistic forms of human ambition are playing local social and political games within your social network and class. And if you don't have a lot of capital, you don't have a chance of affecting the broader world anymore. Since AIs are better poets, artists, philosophers, why would anybody care about what some human does? 
unless that human is someone they personally know. The children of the future will live their lives in the shadow of their parents with social mobility extinct. So I'm curious to know what you think about what's written here. This is a very good take on kind of like the other side of the equation, people that are concerned about AGI and automation and UBI and see it as a sort of human disempowerment. For me personally, and this is just my opinion, I'm not trying to force it on anybody, but a lot of this stuff doesn't really makes sense to me. For example, people's labor gives them less leverage than before. I myself, nor anyone that I have ever known, took a job to have leverage. Every single person I know with a job took that job to get paid so they can buy things they need to survive, to feed their family, to have a roof over their head. When people decide about two different jobs, which one to take, they'll take a look at things. Well, this one pays more money. This one has better benefits. This one, maybe potentially I can climb higher in the company. It's more of a startup. This is more entrenched. Never once in my life did I hear somebody go, I should take this job because it gives me more leverage over the state. I've never seen that personally. It's interesting because like the first comment on here is basically, if the price of labor goes towards zero, sure, some of the current wealth is kind of locked in. But that's not necessarily a bad thing for everyone. If labor costs go to zero, then the price of goods and services with labor as the input also plummets. And this is the kind of big point that um, Sam Alman was making on his blog. Imagine a Moore's Law for prices where everything that you buy and need to survive gets cut in half every two years. Imagine right now before taxes, you need 100000 to survive, to pay rent or mortgage, to send your kids to school, everything, everything, everything that you need to survive and thrive, etc., in a few years, you need only 50000 to do all of those things. In another two years, only 25000 right? What happens if that continues? As this person puts it, who cares if my neighbor can afford 10,000 times their maximal needs while I can only afford 100x mine? Right? He's saying increasing purchasing power is an end that is innately good. It's hard for me to imagine how the inverse might be true. And this is kind of the big point that I think is missed here. Like when you take some money and you give it to some people, you make life better for those people. You make those people a little bit more wealthy. If you reduce the cost of all goods and services, you make everyone more wealthy because the purchasing power goes up. The other point is this, well, you know, where he's saying AIs are better, poet, artists, philosophers, everything. Why would anyone care what some human does unless that human is someone they personally know? I recently started playing chess again online and through the, the phone apps and stuff like that. And the chess AI is superhuman. Literally, none of us could ever beat it. Does that ruin my enjoyment of the game? No. Does it improve it? No. It doesn't really have an impact at all. Really, I care about my progress, my improvement, my enjoyment, and I'm matched with people that are of my skill level, and I play against them. Recently, I had a niece and nephew that started playing the piano, the keyboard. They started to learn how to play basic songs. You know, AI can play piano really, really well. My niece and nephew, they're terrible. Well, they might be watching this. They're doing great. They're doing really, really well, and I'm very proud of them. They're not quite as good as uh, AI yet, but it doesn't matter to me because I like hearing them play. There was some live music at a restaurant that I went to the other day, and I really enjoyed hearing it. I don't know where those particular players rank in the world's sort of best band or whatever instrument players they are, nor do I really care. He says here the only realistic forms of human ambition are playing local social and politics games within your social network and class. What does that mean? Is that like who has the best Christmas decorations in the neighborhood? Is that what that's referring to who holds the highest position at the homeowners association right now people can pursue their ambitions in many different ways for example if you want to work out you can join a bodybuilding competition and go up against people you know in your regional area or the state or the country worldwide mr universe or whatever and compete against them in your height division weight division whatever you want to do something a little bit more we get to run through obstacles join the tough mutter race compete there you like a physical activity? Start a gaming league, join a guild, play World of Warcraft, classic, hardcore, vanilla, whatever. You literally can do whatever the heck you want. How would not needing a job prevent you from doing that? 
Also, you don't really even need to compete. There was this lake that I used to bike around and I would track my time on the Strava app and it would allow me to compare my standings with everyone that's taken that loop around the lake on their bikes or running or whatever. You can kind of see how you stand in the world, or at least in that region. And usually I try hard to put up a respectable time. One day I decided to, and this might blow your mind, I decided to casually stroll around the lake. Instead of taking me 10 minutes on a bike, it took me 40 minutes. And I loved it. Not competing on time didn't make my enjoyment less. Not needing to work 40 to 60 hours every single week wouldn't destroy my life. I'd be able to write more, work out more, spend more time with family, and have more free time. And yes, it's true that the entertainment industry would probably really grow to kind of entertain everybody because there would be a little bit more boredom. We would need to figure out something that kind of keep people engaged. We can't just like sit around being entertained all the time. But that's a high quality problem to have. It's a better problem to be solving than, for example, homelessness or people not being able to afford medical bills or good education for their kids, etc. The other sort of post here saying... Um, the missing element in all this is land. Land will remain a zero-sum game and the most important source of inequality. Unless, you know, simulating environments, space habitats, or a political solution. Now, I had to always be referring to the Sam Altman blog post from four years ago. But, like he said, software can think and learn will do more and more of the work that people do now. Even more power will shift from labor to capital. And if public policy doesn't adapt, most people will end up worse than they are today. So here in three sentences, he covered like uh, like like most of this other stuff, like like three pages. And then he continues, we need to design a system that embraces this technological future and taxes the assets that will make up the most of value in that world, companies and land, in order to fairly distribute some of the coming wealth. So instead of trying to keep everybody in their jobs so that they have leverage, we just tax the things that are going to have the most value in the world of that technological future. Land, which is finite, and companies that are producing all the stuff using AI and robots, etc. You're not going to be able to tax income anymore because there's not really going to be an income, right? No one's going to be working. Also, this idea of AI trillionaires will have near unlimited and unchecked power because they've had uh, capital. I is that necessarily true? Right now, people with money do have power because they can pay people for their labor they can give people money to do what they want maybe bribe politicians put money towards campaigns support certain causes because everything costs money there's a demand for money again in that situation where you can afford a hundred times your sort of uh, maximal needs and some rich ai trillionaire comes over and says hey i'll pay you to do this thing that i want you to do i'll bribe you or whatever and now you can have, you know, 10,000 times your maximal needs. You know, how motivated are you to take that deal? Seems to me like really what matters is, is this price reduction realistic or, or something like it? Can automation greatly, greatly and consistently reduce the prices of the basic goods and services that people need to survive? I think last time I looked up in the U.S., we're paying about 4000 per person, sort of per capita in, in welfare payments to, you know, not everybody, but some small group of people. What happens if the cost of living drops down to 4000 Then we can literally give everybody in the country that money without increasing, you know, the expenditures. It's just it's what we're paying now, basically. So this is really the main question, the way I see it, right? If this works, then UBI is realistic. If we can see this kind of uh, cost reduction, if this is not realistic, well, then we do have some difficult questions to answer. But for everyone to have a job isn't like the ultimate point of life. But let me know what you think. Am I completely full of it? Am I wrong? Am I right? Help me refine my thinking in this. If you made this far, thank you so much for watching. My name is Wes Roth, and I'll see you next time.